Hey class, I have a guest for you today. I'm very excited for you to get to hear from Kelly Little. Um, I'm going to get her PowerPoint up, which you should have a copy of this. All right, and I will introduce you to Kelly Little. Hello. My name is Kelly Little. I'm an occupational therapist, um, certified hand therapist, and certified lymphedema therapist. And I've been practicing for about 20 years. Um, some of my background includes working at Madonna Rehabilitation Hospital on the traumatic brain injury and burn unit, skilled nursing homes, and home health. And currently, I work at Crete Area Medical Center, which is a brain health facility. And I mostly do outpatient hands and lymphedema, but I also do some inpatient home health and skilled nursing. This slide is a picture of my family, my husband, Fred, my daughter, Jaden, and my son, Jacob. Today, I'm gonna to be talking to you about splinting and orthotics, just a brief overview so you can start to get familiar with splinting. The objectives for today include uh, learning the purpose of orthotics, types of orthotics, patient factors, basic principles of splinting, wearing schedules, patient education, skin fit monitoring, key roles for the occupational therapy assistant, and I'm gonna demonstrate fabrication of a splint on Farah. So the purpose of orthotics or splints are to immobilize and allow healing, prevent or correct a deformity, exercise, to provide a low load prolonged stretch, to protect and stabilize, to improve function and to improve occupational performance, and to reduce pain and inflammation. And on the picture on the right, you can see that's my daughter, Jaden. She used to be a gymnast and she sprained her wrist during gymnastics. So I made her a splint on the stove, and that is what she's wearing as she's grooming her cat. So types of orthotics and splints. There is static, serial static, dynamic, static progressive, and exercise splints. The first one, a static orthotic. This type of orthotic has no moving parts, and it holds a joint or an extremity in one position. Some examples of this include like a resting hand splint for someone with a CBA or a TBI due to spasticity, um, arthritis to protect a joint and allow it to inflammation to decrease, finger gutter splints used for like flexion contractures of the digits or uh, other types of fractures, a wrist cock up splint used for carpal tunnel syndrome, wrist pain, fractures or sprains, a thumb CMC immobilization orthotic for things like arthritis, post-surgical, decor veins, tenosynovitis, and thumb pain, or dorsal blocking splints following a tendon repair, fracture, or some type of soft tissue repair. The serial static orthotic, as you see in this picture, is a static orthotic that you can frequently remold to allow for tissue changes or um, improved range of motion or changes in the surgeon's guidelines. Some examples include a finger gutter splint, which is you see in the picture for flexion contracture of the PIP or DIP joints or post-surgical. A dorsal blocking splint post-surgical to limit motion or serial casting following like a TBI or a CBA for spasticity or for contractures. The gentleman in the picture, he has some cognitive deficits and I've tried about every splint on him and we've struggled because he can't remember how to wear them. But this splint, uh, I could quickly just throw in the hot water, straighten it out a little bit more and it's progressed his PIP joint to more extension. He had an ulnar nerve injury, which eventually led to PIB, PIP flexion contractures. I also use serial casting frequently for PIP flexion contractures. The dynamic orthotic, this allows for controlled motion at one or more joints using an elastic component. And I have the arrow pointing to a rubber band that's on that splint. That's what makes that splint 
dynamic is the elastic component. And this one can be used for mobilization following a nerve injury or to gain motion for contractures, mobilization with an outrigger to gain motion or following a tendon repair or nerve injury. Judging from this picture, I would guess this person either had a metacarpal fracture or a P1 fracture, and they're trying to gain some MCP flexion in this with this splint. Static progressive orthotic can be similar to the previous splint. All the difference is there's no elastic components. So the string you see holding that splint back is like a static string, like fishing line or some type of um, string that does not stretch. You can use that for contractures, loss of motion, fractures, or to gain motion. The exercise orthotic is used to encourage motion at a specific joint or target exercises. Some examples include to stretch your intrinsic muscles for the stiff hand, fractures, prolonged immobilization, MCP restriction orthotic following a nerve injury or because of a range of motion lag, or to promote PIP extension. Uh, relative motion orthotic, that's the one that looks like it weaves through someone's fingers. That's just to transfer the motion to specific joints and to help with motor learning or isolate movements. In the top picture on the left, you'll see that's isolating or immobilizing the DIP joint so you can work on PIP flexion. The splint that's next to that is blocking your MCP joints to increase motion at your PIP and DIP joints. The relative motion splint in the, you can see is um, targeting that middle finger that has, is lacking some MCP flexion. And then the bottom picture is a figure eight splint that you see for uh, ulnar nerve injuries because with an ulnar nerve injury, you have hyperextension of the MP joint and hyperflexion of the PIP joint. That splint blocks the MP joint and allows for the transfer of forces to the PIP joint. Some patient factors you wanna consider with splinting. Uh, what precautions are there? What stage of healing are they in? Frequently, the surgeons will give you guidelines for this, but sometimes they don't and you just have to look it up on your own. Uh, some other issues include compliance and comfort, the patient's cognition, the cost of the splint, if their insurance will cover it. Are they able to don and doff the splint? Will they follow up with you? Will they follow up with the surgeon? How are their ADLs or their work affected by wearing the orthotic? And what is their ultimate goal for treatment? Basic principles of fabrication. So you wanna make a pattern because this limits waste and reduces time and allows you to visualize the splint. Some really good splint makers don't use patterns, but I've been making splints for 15 years and I still use a pattern. Positioning, you wanna make sure the patient's comfortable, that their joints are positioned correctly. You wanna use gravity to your advantage. A lot of times the surgeon will give the therapist range of motion requirements for the splint. If they don't, you have to look it up and figure out what is best for that specific diagnosis. You want to protect and comfort bony prominences and make sure that the splint is comfortable to the patient. Fabrication, it's okay to ask for help. Grab another person. Um, it would help if we all had more than two hands, but we don't. So you want to ask for help if you need to. Otherwise, if it's just you, I've used uh, just a wrap to hold the splint in place while I can shape the hand portion or um, I have my scheduler help hold for me sometimes. You need to watch your water temperature so you don't burn the patient, especially if they have a nerve injury. I always put the splint on myself first to, so I know how hot it is. And you want to use the right thermoplastic, meaning is it a drapeable thermoplastic or is it a firm thermoplastic for whatever diagnosis that you're treating. Your strapping should be secure. Uh, wide strapping distri distributes pressure. A narrow strapping allows for more motion and you can number the straps to help a patient don and off the splint if they're struggling. If you're going to make a dynamic or static progressive splint, you want to make sure you have the components available. Outrig outriggers, finger cuffs, line, or elastic. 
as a OTA, you won't probably be making any kind of dynamic or static progressive splints, but you may have to fix one. So if those are in, in your clinic, you wanna have those resources available. Wearing schedules and patient education depends on the purpose of the orthotic, the diagnosis, the status of the healing tissues and the patient needs. You wanna provide the patient or the staff caregiver with a wearing schedule, how to don and doff the splint if needed and use pictures, they are very helpful. If the person's in a nursing home, you wanna make sure you go over with several of the CNAs and the nurses how to don and doff the splint because they will put it on wrong guaranteed and so will the patient who's at home, they will put it on wrong or they will struggle with it. So you wanna make sure they demonstrate this to you, that they know how to take it off, they know how to put it on, and you wanna provide them instructions. Some clinical pearls related to splinting, a low load, prolonged stretch has been shown to have better outcomes than a short, aggressive stretch. And all that means is you're holding the joint at its end range of motion over a long period of time versus aggressive stretching like in the clinic. Patients do better with a static orthotic at night rather than a dynamic. You don't want anyone sleeping in a dynamic splint and you don't want them sleeping in a splint that increases flexion overnight. You can have them sleep in a splint that increases extension but not flexion. So some of the key roles for the OTA um, you may be in a situation where you need to fabricate a small splint or a simple orthotic, or you may need to make adjustments to it. And if you're in a setting that requires this of you, you're going to want to take a continuing education class on splinting. Um, you're always going to have to do patient and caregiver education no matter what. This is usually an ongoing process because people forget, they put the splints on wrong. You wanna make sure you understand the purpose of the splint, the wearing schedule, how to don and, not, don and dock the splint because you're gonna be the one educating. So make sure you have your occupational therapist explain all this to you and show you how to don and dock the splint, especially if it's a complicated one. You will be the one that's monitoring for skin changes or skin breakdown that can include color changes, temperature changes, sensation, pain, swelling, and you're gonna be able, you're gonna to need to have to problem solve this in these situations. You also will be the one who makes referrals to the occupational therapist if you feel a client is in need of an orthotic. And in a skilled nursing setting, frequently you're the only one there all week. So you may be the one who's ordering an orthotic if the skilled nursing setting does not have the resources to fabricate splints. And nine times out of 10, this is how it works in skilled nursing facilities. You order from a catalog versus fabricating a splint. So that is something you're gonna need to know how to do and know what you're looking for because you may be the only one there for the entire week. So next, I'm gonna actually fabricate a splint on Fera and then in the future or whenever, if you have any questions, I have my email up here. You can email me and ask questions, or if you find yourself out in a setting and you need to have a question about a splint or what to do, you can always email me with that too. All right, thank you. Okay, we are going to make a splint now, and if you are a splint maker, you need to have a good splinting book, and this one is mine, because anytime you get a diagnosis and you don't know what to make for someone, you just look it up. So we are gonna be making a CMC splint that you would use like for someone with arthritis. I'll show you the pattern for that. And this is the pattern. Okay, cool. And I'm gonna use your right hand because okay. you don't have any jewelry on that. So I'm just gonna trace Farah's hand. And I always just use paper towel for my splint patterns. It doesn't have to be fancy. And then I'm just putting X's by her joints. 
Okay. And then I just look at the picture and I draw my pattern based on the picture. This is why you take art class, so you know how to do this. And it's why I'm not an art major. <laughs> One thing that's fun about splinting is you get to be creative and you get to make things. I've made splints up before that aren't in a book just to accomplish a purpose. So you get to use your creative side a little bit. Just hold your hand like that for me. So now I'm just checking for size to make sure it's roughly the right size. You can always take away, you can never add to. So you want to make sure, if anything, you err on the side of being too big. These are scraps, so. Just use what you can. Most splinting material is stretchy, so if it doesn't quite fit, then we can stretch it out and make it work. So this splint would be like if you had someone who said they're, they have arthritis in their hand and they're having a lot of thumb pain, you put them in a this type of splint so that they can rest that joint and the inflammation can calm down. I just have a regular electric skillet here that I'm gonna put the splinting material in. The difference between electric skillet and a actual split pan is you need to be careful because it gets very, very hot. And your split pan, you can actually control the actual temperature. So if you were fixing a splint, you could heat up some water in an electric skillet, dip the thermoplastic and just kind of adjust it if you needed to. Made a split? Um, probably 20 years ago. <laughs> I had to do one on field work. I was terrified. Okay. Um, Did you ever have to adjust them or yes. fix them? Yes. Adjusting them is a very common thing, I would say, with OTAs. Um, new straps, new mm -hmm. Velcro. Mm -hmm. If there's an area that's causing some pressure or... Um, trimming it when there's too much material and some some of that is not apparent in the first few days of wearing the splint but maybe afterwards so that's a very good point usually i tell my patients you know we get the first splint they say it looks fine feels fine and then i tell them to pay attention to where it's rubbing where it's hurting i tell them how to um, inspect their skin and then the next time they come in, they usually will say, oh, it rubs here, it's uncomfortable here, could you fix this? So it's never perfect on the first make. You know, a lot of places have gone to using casting material for splinting, which you can't adjust. Mm -hmm. So I don't like that mm -hmm. as much, that quick cast. Is it? less expensive or why would they I think it's easier. faster ah. it's faster um, I know Madonna went to that for a while I don't know if they're still doing that but it you can't adjust it so yeah. once it's you it's made over. it's made yeah and I just like to check the temperature to make sure um, it's not too hot I'm gonna have you make the okay sign Okay. Okay. And I use my fingernail as a pin. So you can relax. Um,
Now a splint like this, the person would be wearing all the time because they're trying to rest a joint. So you definitely want it to be comfortable, as comfortable as a splint can be. But usually they're in enough pain that they're gonna wear it. Okay, sign. I'm making her do the okay sign so that I know that she's got enough emotion. And then I'm wiggling her thumb around so that her thumb doesn't get stuck in there. Okay, okay sign again. And I don't want it to block her MPs and I don't want it to block her wrist. This one and is that hitting your mm -mm. your not even on this one here? Mm -mm. Okay. Then move your wrist. All right. So when I look at it, I see that this is kind of raised up, and I don't like that. So I'm gonna fold that down. And if someone has a really painful thumb, a lot of times I'll have them take their own splint off because they know what hurts and what doesn't hurt. Mm. So that you're not tugging on something and exactly. Yeah. If you listen to your patients, they will tell you what you need to do. They are your best guidance on what you should fix or what you should change. And then if I had any like sharp edges, I would just heat it and then just kind of rub my finger along it to make that smooth. Okay, and then this to me looks like it would bother you. So move your index finger for me. Oh yeah. Pinches a little bit there. So the one thing I don't have here is a heat gun. So normally I would probably just use a heat gun to fold that in. I would also use a heat gun to put on the Velcro so it stays on better. But I did not bring a heat gun. So you guys haven't seen that yet, but it it looks kind of like a hair dryer, <laughs> but it's it produces a very high heat to melt the splint so that you can mold it and change it. You have to be very careful with them because they get very hot. Yes. I have melted a hole in my pants before. With oh them. my. How's that my job? <laughs> like, is something burning? Oh, it's me. That's my flesh. Okay. <laughs> I'll let you put that on. Yeah. Yeah, and did you guys see how she made me move in many different ways to make sure that this part wasn't rubbing on my skin? And then when she found out it was, that's she, I don't know if you can see how it's a lot smoother there and it, it's not restricting. All right, so I'll let you take it off. And if I had a heat gun, what I would do is heat up right here and then I would score it so that the Velcro will stick to it and then I'd heat this up, score it, and then with my actual tabs, I would put this on here, heat this up with the heat gun, I'd heat the sticky side with the heat gun and then I'd apply it. That makes it stay on better. Mm -hmm.
Same thing, heat this, heat this, and then put that on there. And then have her put it on again. Plus that kind of gives the patient, I don't know, kind of ownership, like this is yours, you put mm -hmm. it on yourself, yep. and then they're probably more likely to put it on correctly and not backwards or upside down. So we've done it several exactly. times in front of you. Yes, and I just had a gentleman, he, had some, he was a region five guy and he had some cognitive deficits. He had a, a metacarpal fracture and he had to wear a splint for quite a long time. And he had me adjust it probably five times um, on different occasions. And I always listened to him and I always adjusted it because he knew he was wearing it all the time. He knew it was rubbing here, it was uncomfortable there or pushing here. And so whenever he'd come in and say, this hurts right here. I would we get over to the splint pan, we'd heat it up, and we'd fix it. So always listen to your patients. Good advice. And okay, that's yeah, it. Very cool. I'll yeah, let you guys see it up close. CMC arthritis splint. So that is providing support due to you know the mass and pain, or usually someone has a CMC um, has pain there, and they have pain usually in their MP also of the thumb. It's a very common diagnosis. And you just need to rest the joint and allow it to heal. And what would the wearing schedule be? What would you recommend? You when want? people are in the acute phase, like their arthritis is really flared up, I, I tell them to wear it all the time except for bathing. So for arthritis, you know, obviously they're going to have to take it off for certain things because you can't function. But otherwise, they need to wear it all the time. There are some splints out there that are really good for people who have CMC arthritis pr problems all the time. Um, and if someone's constantly having issues, I'd probably order them one of those splints because they're more functional. But if it's just a short flare up, I would get them this. And then what they would do is probably wear that for about four weeks and they're probably being treated by their physician with some anti-inflammatories. And then after that four weeks, their pain starts subsiding. We switch to just wearing it as needed and maybe at night. Or I might get them a neoprene splint, which is a soft splint that they can wear at work and maybe they wear the rigid splint at night. Mm, okay. So we start to wean out of it. And still they can use this hand just fine. Like there's still full mobility, it's just giving them that little support. So yeah, yes. that's very, very cool. Handwriting, a little difficult yeah. with it, but we're typing. Could be done. Could we could be give done. them some sort of maybe adaptive equipment. Exactly, a built-up pin or something so. that they could use in the meantime. Okay. Um, we'll just show you guys also quick some of the standard splints that you may see. This one, you go ahead and talk. So this one's a resting hand splint. Uh, it's prefabricated. Somebody could order this out of a catalog. You know, if someone has a TBI or a CBA and they have spasticity in their hand, and their hand is in a tight fist like Farah just showed you, you want to get that hand open, you could use something like this. And you can make a static progressive splint out of a resting hand splint. So what that means if I would have made this splint is maybe in a week or two, I dip this in hot water again and I'd straighten those fingers out just a little bit more just to um, keep, if someone has a tight hand, to kind of get that hand open. The other thing is this splint is kind of in what's called the safe position. Um, whenever someone has a fracture or a hand injury, you want them in the safe position, which is MP's in flexion of about 70 degrees and the IP's in um, extension. This is considered the safe position for the hand. And that's just so those little muscles in your hand don't shorten. And then this, everybody's probably seen one of these. This is just a common off-the-shelf buy at Walmart splint. Uh, it's a wrist cock-up splint for people with carpal tunnel syndrome or wrist pain or wrist sprain. You'll see people um, get put in one of these after they've had a like a distal radius fracture. When they've come out of their cast or their splint, they'll, the ortho, ortho surgeons will put them in something like this. Uh, it's a very functional splint, very frequently seen. You can send someone to Walmart to buy one or Amazon. 
This splint is um, got met a piece of metal inside of it that you can mold to the shape you want. So you can bend the thumb around, bend the hand how you want it. I'm not a fan of this splint because it doesn't have enough support for the forearm. But sometimes if you're working in a nursing home setting, you do not have a choice. You, get, you have to use what they have available and this might be all they have. So you have to figure out how to use it correctly. And for someone who's, you know, maybe they had their stroke 30 years ago and they um, just have a tight hand, this would probably work. Really, that's small, isn't it? So, mm -hmm. I always try to get the wrist in a little bit of extension. You don't want somebody in a flexed wrist position just because that compresses the median nerve and you can end up with carpal tunnel syndrome. But yeah, this is something you would definitely see in a nursing home. This is something you would see in a nursing home because most of their splints come out of the catalog. So. Okay, that is it. I think that's good with splinting. Very good. Let's 